and uh, talking about so our talk today will be about you know written arterial occlusion in general and this is one of the most uh, you know lethal disease could be encountered with any ophthalmologist and the, the management of this patient really considering one of the high you know emergency that we need to deal with either in um, uh, acute management or if in so to look how you will proceed to investigate and to save life of these patients. Uh, if you look for the, you know, uh, retinal vascular disorders, especially occlusions, we have two types. We have the arteries and vein. What do you think is the most serious? Is the artery, arterial occlusion or the venous occlusions? Arterial as an acute, but both of them are really meanings a lot, not only for the eyes itself, but actually even though for the, uh, you know, systemic issues that could be affecting this patient and uh, could affecting their lives. So saving their lives might be from the early, you know, discovery of this disease, either arterial occlusion or venous occlusions. Uh, I put some examples, you know, arteries is the one that taking the blood to the organs, okay? And this is like the water that coming to your home. So without that water, you cannot survive. In the opposite, when they think that to drain all the, you know, residual things of this water to go to the, you know, uh, you know, for, uh, for, uh, for the, the cleaning up of this is the veins. But the veins are important, you know, why? Because any problems here might be affecting even the sequences of the heart, of the brain, and things. When we are trying to replace arteries, usually we are taking veins. So put this is in your mind, so the work is integral and we need to uh, put them, all of them together are great. So uh, uh, looking for the uh, causes, we have the, uh, you know, the, the representing the uh, second most prevalent retrovati behind diabetic retrovati. So this is the arterial occlusions. And then it's a common cause of severe visual declines, and we know that if there is central artery occlusion or branch retinal occlusion that are thinking the macula, that might be indenting by devastating visual loss. And then we have that could affect not just only the elderly patient, but might be affecting younger patients. And usually they are strongly associated with systemic disease. <clears throat> What are the things, and uh, in looking for the other side, strongly associated systemic disease, this might be a uh, uh, result of uh, uh, any, uh, huge morbidity and mortality in our patient. So discovery of this you know, disease from, through ophthalmologists might be the early change to discover the uh, treatable disease. What are the you know, uh, various types of uh, uh, retinal arterial occlusions? We are simply having uh, cotton wall spots, we have central retinal artery occlusions, we have branch retinal artery occlusion, we have either serial retinal artery occlusions, ophthalmic artery occlusion, or carotid artery disease. So it is huge, you know, variability from where that we have the arterial occlusions, especially the ophthalmology. It is too difficult to cover all these entities in one talk. So today we'll focus only on the uh, first three, and then when we have another times, or I'm going to suggest for the, you know, the uh, residency office to give talks about celiac artery occlusions and ophthalmic. Both of these, you know, uh, differ entities. It's not the same as central artery occlusion or branch retinal occlusion. So that when we are talking about them, we have to look from other, you know, uh, other. If you look for a patient with ocular ischemic disease, it is, it is classified as one of the entities that belonging them. Little arterial occlusion. We cannot cover it here. So I'm looking to get uh, the, uh, another times and we'll uh, talk in details about cerebral artery, which is having three types that could be a shit, uh, isolated, could be associated with ischemic optic, uh, ischemic uh, arterial you know, occlusions. It could be combined with the, you know, uh, with the famous occlusions and so on like that. If each one of them having its own, you know, uh, causes uh, and mortality. Uh, ophthalmic artery occlusion is really one of the you know major branch of the internal carotid artery and you know the occlusion is different you know from the, that we have it it could be partially occluded and that might lead to ischemic ocular ischemic syndromes and you know the signs symptoms of ocular ischemic syndromes differ 
completely from the scintillator. So we have to differentiate, and I'm sure that anyone going for board exams will have a lot of questions from these types of, you know, talks. So let us start with how the blood supplies going to the, uh, our eyes. So we have the main, you know, uh, arterial supply through internal carotid artery, and that divides to ophthalmic artery, and then in turn, ophthalmic artery will give central artery, artery, as you see here, in this one. And then we have short posterior ciliary artery and ciliary arteries. If you look for this is, you know, this is the main central artery, and then we have the short ciliary arteries and the long ciliary artery that extending to the uh, uh, anterior part of the eye. So this is the main arterial supply of the, our eyes. I will not talk because this already we, we cover it. And then we have the uh, ciliary artery, which is an important one. It is present in 20% of the patient, and this sometimes is a, a gift from Allah for us. As patients, sometimes they have a central artery occlusion, but their vision is 20-20. Why? Because of the Serotonin artery. It is almost 18 to 20 percent of the patient they have this serotonin artery, and the, uh, indeed that important how to differentiate between branch retinal artery that coming from the disc and serotonin artery. How you could clinically or by imaging. What is the difference between branch retinal artery coming from the disc and serotonin artery that coming from the disc? FFA it's and clinically, serial uh, artery is that the, uh, the, the the blood you know uh, flow starting with the with the choroidal circulation. That's great. So that's make. But in case that you have occlusion of serial artery, how do you know? Difficult, right? Because already there is no blood coming from the choroids, so you cannot differentiate between you know, branch and especially when they are coming. There is another another clinical hint in the healthy patients. From where that serial artery is coming? Usually from the back and coming from the center of the optic nerve. It's not the same as the branch coming from the major trunk of the uh, of the center of the artery. Mm -hmm. So this is the make sure about it, these guys, uh, because sometimes when we have occlusion, you start uh, is this is. Uh, 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 occlusion of the serial, or this is because you know the serial artery is differ completely, completely from the branch, because here usually the impuli, huh? impuli usually it will not found in the serial but mostly in the branch. <clears throat> okay, how you can make things easy for you when you have a patient with the with the arterial occlusion? It's so simple. We have the three cause triad. And that's make your life easy. So when you have a patient with central retinal artery occlusion or branch retinal artery, think in that way. We have this triad. Think about something from outside, okay? Something inside the blood vessels wall. And then we have the things that inside that flow or stream in the, in the blood vessels. And this is a lot. We have, you know, the uh, impoli. We have the axis of the white blood cells, or we have the, that, you know, some um, uh, deformed blood uh, RBCs, and so on like that. So this is the way that we have. We have luminal obstructions by impuli, as we see here. We have the luminal narrowing either by atherosclerosis with thrombosis, arteriosclerosis, vasospasm, vasculitis, external compression, and then we have retinal. Uh, uh, hypoperfusion and this is a part of the flow of the blood. So putting this is together, it make you easy to make skin for you to categorize what are the cause or the etiology of the arterial uh, occlusion. <clears throat> and this is just repeating to what we have. We have, you know, the endothelial damage either by dysfunction or real damage by surgery, catheter or trauma. And then we have the hypercoability status, either hereditary or acquired. And in the hereditary part, we have uh, factor five leading, you know, deficiencies or you know defects, prothrombin, and we have protein C and ST. Why I'm putting that? Because as ophthalmologists, sometimes the internal medicine doctors usually they are not aware about this. So usually we are keeping reminding them we need to investigate this patient, especially young patient, less than 40 with arterial occlusions, 
okay? Uh, then we have acquired either like cancer, chemotherapy, pregnancy, obesity, or even those stasis, you know, like immobility or polycythemia. And this is easy, you can get it from the history of the patient or doing just simple blood test. Again, this is the cause that related to the uh, cause uh, triad, we'll not go deep in that. This is the most disease and this is available in any thickest, you know, you can find all these causes together, you know. Uh, in, in my opinion, you know, there is a lot, but uh, having some symptoms and focused history in this, I'm sure that you can end it by, you know, very important possible cause that you need to investigate. So usually use your, uh, you know, uh, sense and through the history and physical examination, you can get a lot of decrease this. Uh. So what's happened with the, any arterial occlusion? Usually there is a diminution of arterial blood supply. This is followed by ischemia, and this is normal. As we have it in diabetic patient, they're starting to have, you know, micro ischemia at the level of the uh, capillaries, and then we'll see the sequences. Then we have necrosis, that followed by atrophy, degenerations, and there is dementia replaced by fibrosis. So this is the sequences of any arterial occlusion. <laughs> so, uh, signs of the occlusion, usually it could be focal occlusion of small retinal arterioles like cotton or spot. So this is the most important signs for capillary occlusion. We have global, you know, schema from ophthalmic arterial occlusion and that could be ended by loss of light perceptions, you know, and then we have whitening of the retina. If in though no, cotton, well, no, what we call it? Why? because all the light is closed here from the ophthalmic artery. And then let us go now for the, uh, for the cotton wall spot. Sometimes cotton wall spot is an easy to be, uh, to be diagnosed because it could be confused with many differential diagnoses. But for this patient who's at risk of occlusion, we have to think like patient diabetic, hypertension, cardiac issues, problems, subjected to recent, you know, cardiac care. Think about cotton wall spot rather than to think about, you know, like, you know, retinitis or retinochoroiditis. So let us to see how things move here. This is the cotton wall spot, usually whitish in color, superficial, could be crossing the blood vessels. Uh, the edge, usually it is not very well demarcated, indistinguished. So what are the uh, cotton wall spots means? It's transit, small whitish obesities with feather edge, located within the superficial, okay? And it is representing near fiber layer infarction. I know, I know that you are knowing this, so we don't need to go in, in detail. Uh, usually, the symptoms is very minimal in this patient. My patient having like, you know, relative scotomas rather than to have frank scotomas, either in the macula or if in the, in the uh, visual field. <clears throat> and usually tend to disappear over a period of weeks to several months, mostly from five to seven weeks. And this is the way that we have it. This is usually not important because it's really, it's multiple things together. We have the bleeding, we have the cotton on the we have the disc. So the patient cannot differentiate unless it is isolated. And sometimes getting small one to large one, it's getting too uh, bizarre shape. Uh, this is how it is, uh, you know, uh, formulated. Usually the retinal ischemia and focal hypoxia associated with disruption of the retinal ocular uh, metabolism and transport in the same time lead to accumulation of cellular debris from the disrupted exoplasmic flow. <coughs> and this is why we have it like whitish color. This is the light microscope appearance and usually we have the cystoid uh, bodies and cystoid bodies composed of largely degenerated mitochondria and other intracellular debris as we see here. Fluorescent angiography, usually they have paint fluorescent surrounding it by a little bit of hyperfluorescent at the edge of the intact, you know, retina or capillaries. And uh, this is how we can differentiate it between the, you know, cotton wall spot, real cotton wall spot and uh, uh, types of, you know, retinitis or, you know, another uh, pathology like deposits in the retina. If I may reveal perfusion or ingrowth of new 
uh, capillaries with the previously infarcted area. This is what I called it reactive, you know, uh, not new vascularizations, but telangiectasia at that age. So put that in your mind. It might not be easy to be seen, but when you have good, you know, fluorescein and geography with good mag uh, magnification, you can appreciate that. <laughs> this is another patient. And if you look for the cotton oil spot out, it's hypofluorescence, okay? It's not that dense because the material is not completely blocked, you know, the fluorescence to go to this area. So the camera can easily pick this area as hypofluorescent. Causes, the most important, usually, uh, uh, in this covered diabetic retinopathy in 20% of the patient and systemic arterial hypertension. So this is the two most important causes of cotton. And put in your mind, in healthy patients, single cotton oil spot is deserved to be investigated. So don't forget this. Cotton oil spot is a sign. And it's not just only a sign to observe. When you have a patient having cotton oil spot, never had any systemic disease, please investigate this patient thoroughly. And could be the first signs of what? Leukemia, lymphoma, or HIV. So these three things, please put it in your minds. We don't have to forget. So as, you know, retina uh, people, usually that's very important. Sometimes it could be confused, guys. If it's confused, do fluorescent radiography. And nowadays, we have OCT and OCT and you. All of this is together as a multimodal. It can give you a clue about what you are dealing. Is it cotton or spot or not? <laughs> this is just to summarize for you the causes. You know, ischemia, immune and inflammatory conditions. So it's cotton oil, it's important. We have a lot of things to give together, okay? Uh, for me, as I'm working as retinal angiofiatis, usually I'm thinking in that, especially in young patients. <laughs> we have infectious, we have anabolic, we have new plastic, we have medications induced, you know, like interferon, retinopathy. We have uh, miscellaneous like, you know, debilitary brains, high attitude, retinopathy, papilledema, papillitis. And if there is nothing, then we consider it as an idiopathic. Differential, important for us, myelinated nerve fiber, how we can differentiate simply. Usually, the nerve fiber layer having feathery changes and follow the nerve fiber. So usually, and very thin, simple, you know, uh, and fluorescent angiography at the same time. We have hard to oxidate, and more, most of you know how to differentiate. You know, you the, the hard to oxidate is usually deeper, huh? In the outer plexus for layer and the outer nuclear layer. Uh, retinal drosins, core retinal atrophy, intraluminal uh, plague, and early indigenous keratomatis. This is the most important sometimes. It's giving a lot of confusion. But, you know, usually this is without, you know, uh, uh, cannot come without signs of inflammations, occur inflammations like, you know, vitreous cells, two chamber reactions, vasculitis. So this is the things where can help you to get the, uh, establish the diagnosis, either it is cotton oil spot or not. Vasculitis could be associated with cotton oil spot as well. So let us now to focus about central retinal artery occlusions. It is represent true ophthalmic emergency. I think this is the most important after in the phthalmatis. And usually it's making our life to direct it to this patient to make sure that the patient doesn't have umbilai is going to his, you know, brain or, you know, vital centers in his uh, midbrain. So it's very important usually when you see it, the time lapse between the uh, symptoms and patient uh, presenting to you, it's very important. This is smart, give you how to direct and to deal with your patients. <clears throat> so this is the, you know, the prevalence and incidence of the uh, retinal central retinal occlusions. It is, you know, 0.85 per 100,000 per year, and it's 1.5 percent of 10 years accumulative for a cumulative incidence, and represent 57 of acute retinal artery occlusion. If you get all the uh, retinal artery occlusion branch, still retinal artery occlusions. You know, uh, ischemic uh, uh, arterial ischemic, uh, you know, uh, occlusion or uh, 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 central is is consisting of 57 of these cases. 
So it is the hugest part of the central retinal artery occlusions. It is bilateral in one and two percent of the patients. Male, more than female, and the mean age usually between 60 to uh, 65 percent. And most of the patients more than 90 percent of age. Uh, usually this is the importance. For that we say making young patient and old patient. 40 years old is the you know the uh, deadline or the you know the, the, you know, the cut lines between young and old. If any patient presented with the uh, retinal artery occlusion, either branch or central, at the age of 40 or less, this is too yeah, really serious to take care. And most of these patients, yeah, unfortunately, I can say 50% of them they ended by idiopathic, which it shouldn't be idiopathic. We can call it anti-term. And determined, you know, because uh, idiopathic that's mean okay, you investigate, it's okay, but determined there is a reasons, but we don't know because we are human beings, not reaching to the level that we can know. <clears throat> the etiology of uh, occlusion changed depending on the age of the presentations, and we'll see that immediately. So, what are the characteristics of this, you know, clinically? Usually, there is an inner retinal layer edema, as we see in this case. How does it get yellowish, whitish? Uh, that's why, because of the edema and pycnosis of the ganglion cell nuclei, which lead to this very thick odematous whitish retina. Uh, and when you are looking for the obesity, it's most dense in the vestibular ball because the increased thickness of the nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell layer. The fovea shared the spot because of the intact retinal pigmented epithelium and choroid underlying the fovea. The retinal layers, actually, here the, that one is affected, either from inner to outer, but the choroid itself it doesn't affect it. So still we have the circulations, you know, the RBR functioning. So when you have this whitish or edematous retina, again it's functional, so in offer of your uh, thin fovea, usually it's give you this, uh, this is this appearance of shared. And fovea retina is supplied by corticobillaries. So this is the reasons why we have shared spots. So there are two, you know, uh, explanations why we have this. We have the intact retinal pigment epithelium and choroid underlying the fovea. In the same times, the fovea area is supplied by the corticobillaries. In animal studies. It's showing that, you know, the restoration of blood flow within 90 to 100 minutes leads to no retinal review. Nowadays, we have some results in animals show this is not really the, the fact. 15 minutes or more is really lead to affect badly the retinal uh, layers. So usually 15 minutes is the one that. But based on what we had in the past, we give the chance to look for our patient when they come in the window of 48, uh, 24 to 48 hours. Occlusions persisting more than 240 minutes leads to massive irreversible damage. So controversy exists regarding the optimal window of treatment in humans and the conservative approach in for treatment to 24 and they can extend it to 48 hours. Why? Because, you know, if that's happened, most of the, you know, photoreceptors and the outer retinal layers will be affected badly and cannot come. And we see cases at the end stage, usually they have thin retina with pigmentation and so on. Like. Also, the blood supply could be sometimes, you know, re canalized, <coughs> but still cannot get because the neural elements already been uh, affected. <clears throat> Symptoms, most of us usually this is with pain, loss of visions, usually in few seconds. Uh, the patient's coming to the emergency room, and usually the, yani from counting finger to light, perception in 90% of patients. Normal uh, visual acuity, almost in 15 to 20% in patient because of intact cellular artery. Uh, sometimes the patient might have amaurosis fogax or tumoral arthritis in the older patients, medical problems that could predispose to emboli, embolus formations, or prolonged direct pressure to the globe, or you have to focus a bit in drug history. Echo examinations, 
Usually, starting with the visual acuity, this patient might present it with very poor vision to light perceptions, hand movements, or counting fingers. You have to check the uh, afferent bibular defect to perform optic nerve examination to look the line of tumor arthritis. My critical uh, include afferent bibular defect. Uh, sometimes, you know, they have to have splinter hemorrhage with little bit pale uh, swelling of the disc, at least at part of one of the uh, optic nerve. <clears throat> Examinations mostly characterized by, you know, book scarring, segmentations of the arterial blood flow, shared spot as we see in these patients, uh, tension, uh, tenuations of the uh, arteries as we see here, all this blood vessel is getting attenuated, and umbilical could be seen in 20% of the patients. Uh, and the fundoscopy finding typically resolved within days to weeks of the acute event. So when you have a patient that had uh, a central mm -hmm. artery occlusion, it might be everything is normal in your, uh, you know, in uh, pictures, but the vision of the patient is very poor, so think about central artery occlusion, and this could be, you know, compared by either uh, fluorescent angiography or OCT looking for the retinal layer. And bail disc in the same time. This is a patient that, uh, of mine, young patient, presented with, you know, with a unilateral loss of vision, as you see, in acute stage. See the discount, see the blood fizzles. This is, this is not uh, edited, you know. This is real picture of the patient. Uh, I would like to show this patient is having familiar drosin in both eyes. Because of the retinal artery occlusion here, even for that, we cannot appreciate to see this one. So uh, we, we reversed this case as you know, association between familiar, uh, familiar uh, you know, uh, macrodrosins and retinal artery occlusion in two or three cases together, so we are able to put it. <clears throat> this is a patient with, uh, you know, central uh, retinal artery occlusion with, you know, intact celo retinal artery. Another patient, you see, it, sometimes the celo retinal artery is not reaching to supply the bovia, and this is unlucky patient, actually. Same thing patient with the uh, uh, intact cerebral artery, so uh, the, the, the flow phase looks very well. Huh? So how you can uh, uh, proceed your patient in fluorescent angiography? Usually they have normal choroidal filling, delay in retinal arterial filling. Uh, in the same times, there is a delay in arteriovenous transit, more than 11 seconds, arterial narrowing with normal fluorescent angiography as you see this patient. Sometimes there is a phenomenon called retrograde feeling. And this is related to the, you know, the pulsations with heart rates, you know. You can find that, see, look for these patients, look for the arteries here, and then see all that. And this thing can getting back. So in the beginning, you might see this is short, getting forward, and then getting back. So this is not un unusual. You can find it with the you know, uh, arterial pulsing. So that's what we call it sometimes, you know, retrograde uh, pulse uh, uh, feeling of the arteries, of occluded arteries. <clears throat> but the main thing is, this is the hallmarks. When you see a patient with this, think about central retinal artery occlusions. <clears throat> Another patient with intact. See, this is the difference, you know, sometimes, Cerebral artery is getting from the edge here and felt before, before the uh, uh, arterial branching. So this is how you can appreciate and differentiate between cerebral artery and normal branch retinal artery. Another patient with the central retinal artery occlusion, and you see how much of the ischemia that we have it in this patient book scarring as well. OCT shows highly reflective uh, impuli, uh, plague with the superficial near fit, and the ARG usually having, you know, a diminution of P wave, as you see, compare this and that, corresponding to malar and bipolar cells ischemia with normal A wave. <coughs> Systemic examinations should include, in the emergency room, cardiovascular, to look for murmur or carotid proing, temporal artery arthritis to look for the 
symptoms or signs of uh, of uh, of uh, timber arthritis like timber tenderness, jaw claudications, muscle weakness, or fever. Why, especially for the patients who is above 50, because this is might be one of the manageable and treatable uh, cause, especially with steroid. And might we need to have biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. But if you have it in your mind, please yeah, contact your colleagues in the neurology and send it to them, let them to take the biopsy and start immediately the systemic steroid. Causes, I think we'll talk about it. We'll not go deep in that, but with the, with the, with the, with the, with the talks, we can get how we can reach, approach this uh, causes. So we have to determine the underlying etiology. That's important to prevent recurrence of central lateral artery occlusion and other vascular complications. Causes of central lateral are vary depending on the age of the patient, and it could be classified as carotid artery atherosis. This is number one. Second, systemic cardiovascular disease, heart and its association. Third one is hematological disease, you know, like hypercoagulity or hypo. Then we have the inflammatory disease like systemic lobus arthritis. We have uh, rheumatoid arthritis. We have, you know, vasculitis. And then we have to put rare causes, like what? So syndrome, it is rare, okay? Or unusual situations. If you are looking for ather atherosclerotic changes or disease, we have three mechanisms, either bioemboli or hemodynamic significant carotid artery stenosis or arterial spam. So this is how the uh, carotid atherosclerotic could lead to retinal arterial occlusion. And in 45% of the cases, might lead to central lateral artery So one of the major causes here, we have the carotid disease or obstruction. Then 16% or greater is turnus in 20%. So this patient who is having central lateral artery occlusion lead to central artery, uh, lead to central artery occlusion is because of carotid atherotic changes. They have 60% of them obstruction of their, or partial obstruction of the carotid artery. So put these figures in your mind, <coughs> in your mind when you are uh, dealing with this patient. Uh, central artery and high-grade carotid disease found in three uh, uh, of seven that subsequent stroke over 45. So there is this, this is an important index and to uh, expect of this patient how they can and predict this patient had danger. Systemic cardiovascular disease, usually in detail, you know, analysis of comorbid disease, it showed that systemic hypertension in two-thirds of the patient, <coughs> diabetes mellitus, cardiac valvular disease in one-fourth of the patient, cardiac anomalies like uh, patent foramen ovale, and other like uh, hyperlipidemia, carotid artery disease, coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, timber arthritis, and in addition to uh, cigarette smoking. Emboli usually associated with poor visual acuity, higher morbidity and mortality, when you see it. Uh, emboli from the heart are the most common cause of central artery in patients younger than 40. So emboli usually indicating young patients. Amorosis fogax is the, you know, the preliminary signs of uh, emboli. How we can look for this from our side? Usually the presence and significance of asymptomatic renal art arterial emboli, usually it's present symptomatic in 1.3 to 1% of the patient, as we see here. And it is 3% in patients 75 years or old. What are the associated systemic risks? This include male sex, increased age, systemic hypertension, cigarette smoking, history of vascular disease, or surgery. And people with retinal emboli, they are three times at risk to experience a fatal stroke than those without emboli. This is important for us because this is, yeah, can help us to sometimes to increase, you know, or the expectancy of our patient aid. No survivorship, 56% mortality rate over nine years. When you compare it with 27% in age matched group. When you put these two groups, the patient with Feasible, you know, uh, uh, feasible asymptomatic uh, uh, emboli when you compare it with the people with age mass without any 
uh, in blue light. So that's an important usually to put in our eyes. And life expectancy in central retinal artery chronic is 5.5 compared to 15.4 percent for an age matched. Uh, without central retinal artery occlusions. Hematological disease include coagulopathies uh, like sickle cell anemia or hypercoagulations uh, like factor V leading mutation, protein S deficiency, protein C deficiency, or anti with antibodies. <clears throat> Inflammatory causes include a lot, and uh, here we have cell arthritis, we have Sozak syndromes, we have systemic lobus, we have polyarthritis nodosa. Wigner's granulosis, and then we have Paget disease. And I believe that Paget disease is one of the common causes of retinal arterial occlusion in our communities. In rare cases that consider in young patients include Paget, syphilis, migraine. Migraine is usually sometimes, you know, ignored. There is a lot of young patients, they come with amaurosis fogax, and you are missing that to get the history of migraine. And this is mostly Diagnosis of exclusions. You cannot come from the beginning and you say this is migraine related. Usually we have to do our full investigation and then we say Get this is a migraine related. Uh, prolonged direct pressure to the globe in an unconscious patient and that could be in our practice. Usually a patient who is in the ICU and usually he's not aware and people who's taking care at that time might putting some pressure over the eye, or during the surgery when I'm working in one eye and really forgetting the other eye, this patient after surgery find that the good eye is already blind. Why? Because of this long pressure over the globe. Uh, in adherent, you know, intraocular injections of gentamicin, uh, arteric ischemic cortic neuropathy, uh, other causes of shared spot like Tay-Sachs disease or other uh, storage disease. <coughs> so, uh, workup and investigation of this patient based on the suggestive medical history, direct tailored the diagnostic workup to the most likely etiology. It is difficult to put, you know, battery of test and go on. So based on our history, physical examination, we can. But most important, acute case of uh, central retinal artery occlusion, this patient need to be sent to, you know, cardiologist to make sure that about, you know, cardiac stasis and then we can. This is the test that we need to do it. After physical and complete history, we have to have ECG, lab test, including all this together. And in younger patient, we have to have anti-cardiolipine antibodies, ANA, and uh, double strand DNA. I will not go in detail because I'm sure most of you will find this is in the thickest book. Uh, carotid ultrasound imaging to evaluate the atherosclerotic disease. It's appeared to be more sensitive than carotid Doppler. But as screening, Doppler is it's available everywhere so that can give us hint about what is the percentage of obstruction and if we need, we can do more and more uh, carotid ultrasound. Sometimes, magnetic resonance uh, angiogramming, it could help and give more details about these areas of, you know, atherosclerosis and, uh, you know, that released uh, evoli. <coughs> Differential diagnosis of central retinal artery should include ocular ischemic syndromes, uh, versus retinopathy, severe commercial retinae, and inflammatory or infectious retinitis. It is true emergency, and we need to treat patient within the first 24 hours, and if it is the chance to have this less than 12 hours would be great. Therapy include lowering intraocular pressures, increasing retinal perfusion, increasing oxygen delivery to hypoxia. This is the most important three elements. If I'm asking anyone how you would deal with the patient with send acute central arterial closure, I need to hear these three things. And I need why. Because most of us, they do it as just only because it is keep it in his mind. No, every one of this having its own reason and cause. What we call it, the conservative treatment, arterial vasodilation, reduction of intracranial pressures and improvement of perfusion, antiplatelet therapy, reduction of red blood cells rigidity, uh, and hyperbaric oxygenism. And invasive management include YAG laser arterotomy and embolectomy or local intraarterial thrombus by urokinase or 
So this table is summarizing everything. We have the vasodilators to increase blood oxygen content, and this is all the medication that, or the, uh, the things that we do. Uh, Bento, uh, bentoxifilin that could help to increase the blood. Inhalation of carbogen help to increase the blood oxygen content. Hyperbaric and sublingual isosorbid uh, denitrated could help. So this is the first group, okay, of the management. Then we have the ocular massage, why? Ocular massage to reduce internal pressure and hence increase the retinal artery perfusion or help the sludge of the embolite. How we can do that? We do that with anterior chamber, paracentesis, we give intravenous acetazolamide, intravenous mannitol, topical antiglucoma medications. So this is the things that we do it in this category of treatment. Intervenous methylprednisone to reduce or decrease of retinal odia. This is, could be helped, especially when are suspicious of possibility of inflammatory reason. Don't hesitate because now we are in real emergency. We have, as we now mentioned, YAG laser embolectomy to lice or dislodge the clot. Sometimes nowadays people they would like to get in surgery and immediately to do what we call it embo. Uh, lectomy or something like that. It can be done if the patient is really willing and you have the facility to do it in the same time. Then we have intraarterial or intravenous thrombolysis to help in thrombolysis of the empoline. And this is need really good centers with hematologists around you because this is not free of, of uh, complication, especially when you have a patient at this stage and lead to hemolysis in the brain might be the patient will get affected badly. This is how we do the uh, interretinal uh, arterial fibro, uh, fibrolysis, and usually the evidence is limited in this, and the success has been observed with few cases of intraarterial tissue plasma activators administration. Systemic complication include transit, ischemic attacks, stroke, and hematoma. So we have to do it in very well you know, facilitated centers with experts. Uh, carbogen therapy, uh, carbogen therapy by 5% uh, CO2 and 95% of uh, oxygen that lead to dilate retinal arterioles and uh, uh, oxygen increases oxygen delivery to the ischemic tissue. It's performed for 10 minutes every two hours for 48 hours. 10 minutes every two hours for 48 hours. Sometimes it's difficult to have this, so you can do it by putting, you know, you know, nylon bag over the head of the patients without that closing, and that could do the uh, job. <clears throat> Hyperbaric oxygen therapy increased visual recovery by early treatment less than hours from onset of the symptom. This is difficult for us. If you look in real, where we have, you know, uh, hyperbaric oxygen uh, chambers. It's only in, maybe in the, you know, that I think in the, in the military hospital, they might have that. So if you are having, you know, the chance to do it, you can send the patient. Nowadays, we're using the, you know, code of the emergency, 937 or uh, something, 1937, it could help you to direct your patient, as we do in the cardiac care. Immediately, the patient could be sent to area where you can, but put in your mind should be less than 12 hours. How that work usually? Uh, uh, you know, by inhalation of 100% of oxygen at two atmospheric absolute that provides an arterial uh, partial pressure of uh, 1,000 to 1,200 millimeter of mercury, and that resulting in three folds increase in oxygen diffusion to ischemic retinal tissue, and that's how the patient is recovered. 40% of the patient improvement. Uh, of two or more levels of visual acuity. So but that's need to know where this, you know, chamber available so you can send patient immediately. Uh, the follow-up of this patient with central therapy, they have to have at one to four weeks, check for nephoscarization of the disc or iris. And this is the risk of, you know, nephoscarization. Usually it's uncommon. And looking for nephoscarization of iris, it's 18 percent. And uh, that need to be treated by uh, Bandital photogrammetry before they get to nephoscular glaucoma. Nephoscarization of disc is two to three percent, so it is very 
low percentage when you compare it with the revascularization of the iris. Visual accuracy prognosis of this patient, 20% of the patient, they have visual improvement of six uh, gradient of visual acuity, 35 to three gradient of visual acuity, 25 to showed no visual improvement. And 5.4% of this patient of central retinal artery occlusion recovered visual better than uh, continue uh, counting fingers. 10% retains third, uh, central vein due to uh, central fusion due to presence of retinal artery, as we mentioned earlier. <coughs> uh, uh, retinal emboli, already I think I mentioned that, so I don't like to go more and more about it. And see that myocardial infarction, main cause of death in this patient with the central retinal artery occlusions, especially. Branch retinal artery occlusions are almost the same as we have in the, in the central retinal artery. And we, the only thing is that instead of all of the retinal tissue is affected here, usually we have sector areas that are affected, but actually the same principle of that we have it in the central retinal artery. I will not go the most important here, we have to focus in the type of emboli that you have it, because branch retinal occlusion mainly caused by emboli, either cholesterol, platelet fibrin, or calcified, or other types of uh, emboli like endogenous emboli, exogenous emboli, or could be for non-embolic types. <clears throat> As we said before, we'll not talk about these things because this sequence is normal in any occlusion lead to ischemia and you know uh, degenerations. Branch retractor is most likely to occur at the bifurcations of an artery. And branch retinal artery occlusion, 90% temporal retinal blood physics. So usually temporal, temporal branch retinal arteries are more affected uh, than uh, when you compare it to the nasal ones. It's represent 38% of the acute uh, retinal artery occlusion. There in the central artery are most 67 or 76. Here it is 38. Uh, usually this is the age, but if it is presented rarely in a patient younger than 30 years, it should be taken in consideration. Symptoms usually uh, depends on the area that affected, either in the macula or out of the macula. Medical problems we need to think as we did in the central uh, retinal artery region, including endocarditis, infective uh, carotid stenosis, coagulopathies, and arterial blood. Uh, risk factors include smoking, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, coronary artery disease, history of strokes, transit ischemic attacks. And 75% of the patient have hypertension or carotid uh, occlusive disease. Examination not change, almost the same, but instead of diffuse, you know, uh, retinal oedema, we have usually uh, sectorial uh, corridor. The uh, types of, uh, of, uh, types of uh, you know, emboli are like cholesterol, usually it is uh, uh, called uh, Horinhorst, uh, Plex appears as a resistant thin yellow. So that's an important to look for it. This is the types of what we have. So uh, cholesterol usually appears like this, usually the size between 10 and 250 millimeter in diameter and less than 10 millimeter. Here, what's happened usually when you are looking for that, you know, uh, uh, the blood is usually furrowed while it is there. So usually the obstruction is not related to this unless it is associated with other type of emboli like uh, fibrin platelet types. So then they, they will get the obstruction. And digital pressure on the eye can make them turn within the fissures, causing them to become more or less visible to the examiner. <coughs> So please make sure about the types of this. Again, as I mentioned before, then platelet fibrin in the lights, very clear, you see the thread hair is getting in the side. It's usually it is not blocking. It is, unless it is getting together, huge one and calcified. Uh, they are usually associated with carotid or cardiac uh, thrombosis. Calcified emboli, usually yellowish in color as we see here, and they are more likely found in the uh, area of the disc, and they are associated with calcified uh, cardiac valves and atheromatous plaques of the carotid artery. 
fluorescent and geography of branch retinal artery occlusions almost related to the localized area that affected by arterial occlusions. Because the time, I don't like to... Uh, electroretinograms, usually, it could be normal. Sometimes, show loss of oscillatory potential and transit uh, depressions of the P wave in the case of large branch retinal artery. Emboli is the most common etiology of branch retinal artery in the patient. And if you look, you know the percentage, cholesterol emboli 40%, uh, for uh, 40 patients from 70, platelet for, uh, fibrin emboli 8 of 70, and calcified emboli 6 uh, uh, of 70 patients. Other causes could be include leuco emboli, uh, vasculitis, Bosch, uh, Bocher's retinopathy, septic endocarditis, fat emboli following lung bone fractures, amniotic fluid emboli, complications of pregnancy, tumors, you know, uh, atrial myxomas, uh, talc emboli, uh, corticosteroid emboli, uh, air emboli uh, following trauma or surgery, and synthetic material used in cardiac and vascular procedures. So this is the most common other causes of the, you know, uh, of uh, 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 emboli, we have to put it in our mind. You can expect it that when you get history from these patients. Non embolic include thrombosis associated with atherosclerosis, vasculitis, vestibular inflammatory condition like toxoplasmosis or vascular disease, and vasospasmal as migraine, coagulopathies will not go in this because we already we talked and compression, as we said, like you know, very arterial uh, retinal loops, vitrocutaneous surgery, and trauma. Or we have adiabatic. There is no reasons. And examples of that, so SOSAC syndrome, which is micro angiopathy of, fibrin, of uh, brain, retina, and cochlea, has been seen in more uh, patients. So in younger patients, other more obscure and diverse etiologies are more likely. Causes, as you see here, will not go in deep because we need to look for this in tissue, especially with the patient less than 30 years or 40, I can say migraine, coagulopathy, abnormality, and atheromatous disease uh, merit more uh, comprehensive review. Routine carotid angiography is not recommended in this patient because this patient usually they have normal carotid, not like the patient uh, with old, uh, older age. And visual prognosis is similar to the elderly patient. Patients with branch retinal vein uh, arterial occlusion have higher risk of morbidity and mortality, secondary to cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease, and the thromedical workup is indicated for all patients with branch retinal artery, and the etiology can be identified in as many as 90% of the patients. This is the you know, labs, which are not, it's almost the same as that we have it in the central retinal artery occlusion, and then you can see the treatment, actually no special treatment, and least there is complications, like you know, patient having vascularization or having uh, uh, side attacks. And uh, considering the increased rate of mortality, patient with branch retinal artery should receive full medical workup with special attention to the cerebrovascular and cardiovascular disease. Depending on the finding, carotid endoarthrectomy or anticoagulation may be indicated. So this is depending on your carotid. If it is more than 90%, you know, obstructed, then my this patient will get benefits if he's having endorectomy uh, of the carotid, and that could help in sending patient to the hematologist or uh, cardiovascular surgeons. Follow up. This patient need to have uh, regular follow up until their problem is resolved or there is no new vascularizations. Complications. Usually less than that we have it occur. I mean, uh, when you compare it with the, with the central retinal artery occlusion, but nephascularization is the most important. Regarding the prognosis, usually it's very good. 80 to 90 percent of the patient improved to 2040 or better in their visual acuity, and some degree of visual field deficit usually persists where the area where there is skin. Increasing mortality, secondary to fatal stroke, usually you have to consider it in this patient. And the most common cause of it is cardiovascular disease in these patients. Education is important, so the patient will be aware about his situation, and that might need to be having regular follow-up with his internist to prevent anything. By this, I can finish the first part of this talk. We'll look for other times. 
or when you have a time and suggest it, you can just see at what time you can do it in the afternoon, the other times, because it's difficult to go for all these talks in one hour. Thank you very much. If there is any questions, I'm willing. Are you up? Yeah, we noticed uh, recently, uh, I mean, the, the past few years, uh, the use of cosmetic fillers, uh, and we've seen a, a lot of cases in the ER uh, secondary to the filler use uh, with vision loss and central retinal artery closures. So I think one of the new proposals nowadays is uh, the filler of cosmetic thermal fillers. Uh, great question, Dr. Hamoud, because this is really uh, recently, and there is a lot of reports about this. What's happened when, uh, with the filler? You know, they injected underneath the skin. And this, uh, you know, filler escape, you know, to the uh, orbital apex, where all the blood vessel is coming there. And it trapped it and making huge pressure over retinal arteries. And not only that, if you thought that lead to occlusion of all, you know, arterial supply to the orbit, to the lids, and they having the ecomosis and things. And this is actually, unfortunately, unrecoverable. We have hydrolysis to resolve this, you know, uh, uh, you know, it is, it's not like hello, you know, we put it in. They are trying to inject some hello rays, dissolver or, you know, but this is cannot be achieved because already this, uh, you know, hello rays is interrupted in between the, and cannot be taken out. It is involved all the compartment of the soft tissues. And this is why we are saying that for this people, this type of, you know, uh, cosmetic procedure needs to be done by the people who knows very well the anatomy. And to be done with the, uh, either plastic or microplastic. Nowadays they do it with, you know, I can't say technicians. That's, and in this hospital night you have four or five cases. Ended by full loss of vision in their eyes in a minute. Would you recommend the use of uh, like uh, retrobulbar injections, maybe with high lace, uh, it, it, as an emergency setting? Uh, they do, they try, but is it is it uh, how much of this patient could uh, have it? Because this is the try it outside, yes. you know, they inject okay. immediately, okay. but they couldn't recover because already you know the 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 uh, you know the you know the material being stuck to the you know tissues. And in the compartment, it cannot be easy getting out. So trying, we have to wish to, to, to resolve such because we have young ladies, they get it that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.